Okay, welcome everybody to episode 16 of Zip Chat. Uh, this is Kristen Massey. I am the content marketing manager with Accelerate. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our host, uh, Mike Watson. So Mike, over to you. Hey, Kristen, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to Zip Chat episode 16, cloud app application monitoring with Dynatrace. Um, and today we're gonna be talking not just about application monitoring, but the more evolved term of observability. Um, we did a, a zip chat on this uh, earlier, a couple months ago. And so this is kind of an extension of that. Um, just real quick, um, I'm the SVP of Agile Product Engineering here at Accelerate. Um, I am have a background in engineering leadership and I really enjoy talking about these topics. So I'm always happy to host these zip chats. So these zip chats are a panel discussion. They're intended to be, you know, fairly light. You know, we're not going to present any slides or do anything like that. Uh, this is really more of a discussion. And if you have any questions or you want to get involved, just let us know, and Kristen will try to get your questions to me so that we can ask them out. Uh, so with that, I'm going to introduce the panelists. So with me, I have Alois Wrightbauer. He's from Dynatrace, and he's the chief technology strategist. Uh, Hey, Alois, how are you doing today? Hello, how are you? Doing well. So, and also with me is Brenton Martin. He's uh, our, here at Accelerate, he's our product, production support manager. How's it going, Brenton? Doing well, thanks for thanks for having me on. Happy to be here. I don't think we're gonna have any guitar playing during the zip chat, so. Oh, we can, just let me know. I'll take requests. <laughs> awesome. All right, so, um, like I was saying, we've been talking about observability uh, on these zip chats uh, in the past. And in those previous episodes, we talked a lot about the evolution of observability and you know, sort of briefly what it's about and where it's heading um, in the tool space. Today, we want to take a slightly different twist and we want to talk about like how to get started and what are the organizational challenges and other things that you might face as you uh, start the journey. So uh, with that, let's start with a quick poll. So how familiar are you with observability? So this is a quick test of the audience to see if people are you know, new to the topic or very familiar. Uh, we can obviously tailor our conversation a little bit based on what we see in the results. Kristen, let me know when everyone's got a, got a chance to vote. Will do, we're almost there. Do we got all the votes, or at least enough to get going? Yeah, I think enough. I think we can close it out. Somewhat familiar for the win. <laughs> um, yeah, that sounds about right. Surprises there. <laughs> Obviously, people are coming to a, a zip chat to talk about observability, and they probably have a good idea what it is, but need help. So uh, I'm glad to have you here, and hopefully we can provide that help or at least a different uh, view on how things are going. All right, so Alois, why don't you give us you know, your background and a little bit about what you're doing and then also your view on observability, uh, just so everyone has kind of a frame. Yeah, I'm uh, the chief technology strategist, as you mentioned, uh, for a company called Dynatrace. For those of you who are not familiar with what Dynatrace is doing, we are providing a software intelligence platform which uh, allows you to monitor your application, um, analyze data, and also automate actions based on what's uh, happening in the application. So the company started a long time ago. Back then it was called APM, Application Performance Management or monitoring, there was long debate going on what whether it's one or the other. Um, it then evolved into um, what we now do with observability, but our idea like overall is or like the bigger vision is that even at some point in the future, we will build these self-healing and self-securing applications. So the idea is that we take a lot of these manual tasks out of it by automatically analyzing and optimizing so that people and teams can really focus on building applications versus running and uh, securing them. And yeah, yeah, my take on observability, um, obviously I have been in this space for a very long time and on very different topics, started mostly with backend related 
application performance monitoring, then move to the front end space, then move towards open source. I'm also leading a lot of our open source activities here at Dynatrace, also related to um, open telemetry, to web based uh, standards. Actually, the web timing standards inside the browser was also one of the uh, projects uh, that I was working on. And now focusing more and more on the automation bits and pieces. Um, and yeah, when we, we talk about observability, I think how the term really emerged was that there was a lot of people that were kind of unhappy with their very static approach towards monitoring. So just having a couple of charts that you look at and then have to figure out how a system works. And if you follow the, the industry, there's like two, almost two approaches to talk about it. Very often people talk about the three pillars of, observ of observability which is uh, traces, metrics, and logs. So that's a very technical approach where the data is coming from, so where telemetry is coming from, and what type of telemetry data you might have. The other view of observability is what you can actually do with this data. So rather have than having a very static view on the system, the idea is that you can ask questions or that you can do investigation based on how your system is behaving, uh, what, it's, uh, what it's doing, um, and also why it is in the state that it is in, uh, which also relates to that term of observability. So based on the outputs of the system, you want to understand how it's working internally. And also a term that is kind of related to this is the term of AI ops. Um, again, AI and uh, machine learning in here. So the bigger idea is, well, you can ask any question, but you sometimes might not know which question to ask. And there's obviously a lot of data coming in that you have to analyze. And there are a lot of uh, methodologies, technologies out there that can help you to really uh, go through all of the data and analyze it and surface interesting findings without you having to ask uh, questions ex explicitly. Think of it almost like your recommender system that you have somewhere like, and like maybe on a shopping site it would say, well, as you're interested in this application, you might find these actions interesting or these things that happened to you. Yeah, I think that's a very brief yeah. observability <laughs> intro. Yeah, that's that's actually gonna be great because you know the audience did mention that they have you know some some good idea of what's going on. So from there, let's let's go over to Brenton and uh, Brenton, so you've been managing teams and doing application monitoring for quite a while, uh, given your role. So um, I imagine the ultimate goal is customer satisfaction, but what, who else benefits by setting up a proper observability plan? The ultimate goal is always customer satisfaction, but if you look at the the, the, the entire landscape, right, um, of who benefits, it includes internal stakeholders. Um, they have those the, the hard facts, the data of performance of that application. Um, they're able to point to that and use that um, to be able to look at their roadmap prioritize features. Uh, customers obviously benefit because there is proactive monitoring going on uh, in the environment and in the application, ensuring that it is stable and performing optimally. Um, also able to get to critical issues when they do occur faster, getting to root causes faster. So uh, obviously a huge benefit to customers, obviously as well as those doing the monitoring and those teams working in, the, in those areas. But I think most importantly, for that product image and for that company image. Uh, maintaining a stable quality product really ensures your reputation uh, and the, your customer satisfaction obviously is your reputation. Um, so satisfying those customers you currently have uh, as well as uh, continuing to build uh, that rep of being a solid provider, getting new uh, uh, customers coming in. But the development teams as well can leverage this, uh, these monitoring tools, seeing how the application actually performs in production. And in some of our earlier talks, Alois, you brought this up and I wanted to circle back to it was um, developers, in most cases, don't really have a production environment or any kind of mock-up that they can do uh, testing or evaluation. And, and these tools really allow developers to be able to see the landscape of what's happening in that environment uh, and be able to look at features and, and optimization and improvements that they can make down the road. So everyone in the org um, benefits from this development side as well as from a customer success standpoint. Yeah, that all makes sense. So, um, you know, one of the things that might be on people's mind is how, how do you actually get going? Like if you're not 
you're doing some homegrown thing or you're you know you're sort of stuck in the stone age or you're a startup and you need to get started what's the way to get started like how would you do that brent what are your thoughts there uh, you know the best way to get started is to get started when you first really roll out and for some that's not an option if you do have that opportunity put together a team of those SMEs, of those individuals that really know the application and what the application is capable of and have a really good sense of what's going to be asked of that application once it goes live. These SMEs are going to be BAs, developers, uh, individuals from QA, individuals from support who have worked on that application uh, as it brought it to go live. But even if you're coming in and, and, and establishing monitoring on an existing you know, application or systems, um, there, there are individuals in the org that can be uh, prodded for knowledge or mined uh, for, for metrics and telemetry points uh, to be able to focus on, as, as Eloise mentioned earlier. So uh, putting a team together and getting started, that is the most important part is getting the ball rolling. Um, mm -hmm. Once that starts, you're able to build baseline behavior. You're able to uh, figure out what is our nominal uh, and then begin to use, as, as Eloise mentioned earlier, uh, AI, machine learning, anomaly detection, the, these fantastic new technologies that are available uh, to be able to target and improve customer service and satisfaction, head off issues yeah. and resolve issues quicker when they come up. Yeah, that that's interesting. So um, one of the things I was wondering, um, is building that model, I mean, it might change frequently, right, with modern technologies. Um, so as part of the AI and these um, these tools like Dynatrace, are they able to react to that and help you evolve the model in real time? Is that is that part of the product offering? Uh, Eloise, you wanna go ahead? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, actually, it is part of the, the solution. So what you more or less do, you have, um, and in Dynatrace, we call this a smart scape. So it's more or less an entire model of your entire landscape, all the way down from your servers, your network, the processes running, the applications that uh, that are running inside those processes, the functionality they provide to end users and the end users themselves. So you might go all the way up to saying, yeah, one of my premier customers is currently trying to um, check out from the shopping cart or doing things like this. So this this is the the model that is built up, and um, uh, we use um, on the one hand agents and also other data that we import and build up this model in real time, and it also gets updated in real time. So that's uh, that's a, that's a very important point because especially with more modern cloud environments, uh, this model really might change on a minute by minute basis. And you have mm -hmm. to update it, and that's also why manually you couldn't like really update it. You could, you, you rem might remember like the good old days of CMDBs, <laughs> and usually they were outdated once they were created. That's like, uh, I mean, massive job security because somebody always had to update them. So the idea is to really create this entire model of your application really dynamically at, at, at runtime and track all changes on the one hand to that model but also the behavior of the application. So that's also the secret of web, because some people say, well, it's AI and it's doing something magic in the background. That's not really true. It like discovers everything, puts this data into context and learns how it changes and how it behaves over time. So, so just real quickly, um, how, much of, how much work does the tool do versus humans, right? So if you're gonna build out that model, do humans do 20% of the work or 50% of the work um, or is, What's your what's your thought? Maybe it's a strange question, but um, so for building the model, um, most of it can be automated. So I, I think we're like 95, 98 percent of building the model is automated because it's discovered using agents and then created, and then the systems learn automatically. So this is what a, a, a what we call like a software intelligence platform, as Dynatrace gives you really out of the box. You might want to tweak and tune it some uh, in some areas, and you might want to add additional um, uh, information in, in a certain area uh, that where we want to optimize it. But the idea is you really install these agents on your system, or you make them part of your rollout process, and then things will really get get discovered dynamically. That that's also the value if you have to manage like a very large uh, infrastructure. And that's, by the way, also a funny anecdote. When I started working in performance uh, monitoring, we talked about large environments when it was like 100 JVMs. 
and it became at some point like 1,000, then it became 100,000. And today we'll talk in many cases about millions of, of containers. So the order of magnitude of the size of the systems we are talking about, especially with microservices, grew massively. So you can't really have, rely on humans to input all of this data and like to build up this model. It must be fully automated and that's where the entire industry is headed. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. So so the summary of what you're all saying here is just get a tool and go. <laughs> uh, you know, it sounds it sounds simple, Mike, but but to some extent, yes. Um, if you're not monitoring today, um, you're you're waiting for something to happen. Um, if you're actively monitoring, um, you have the opportunity to get ahead of it. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, and the benefits to the customer and everyone, as you mentioned, I definitely make that seem like the right thing to do. So let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about um, you know what happens once you get started. Um, so one of the things. Always, we were talking about in the preps is um, this concept of human bias when dealing with incidents. And uh, I thought you had some interesting things to say about that. Can you share with the audience that? Yeah. Yes. So obviously, most monitoring tools are used primarily if there are problems with your systems. That's where most people honestly get started. And it has been in this space for quite a while. And Usually that's when most people get interested in monitoring when systems do not work, so they don't use them for optimization first. And, but what we have to be aware of when we are in this situation that we have to fix a, a, a problem, and we try to obviously fix it as quickly as possible. And we came up with our own ideas, our own assumptions, why the system doesn't work the way it's supposed to, uh, to work. And uh, there's like a whole list of human bias that comes into play. And like one example is confirmation bias. You have like, you make this high level guess that, okay, it's going to be the database. And what that immediately happens, you look for all indications that it actually is the database because that's your assumption where you wanna go. And you will find maybe a long running query here and there, and you might find some problem here and there, but you might, but what you don't do is you look at all the other possibilities that are in there. So very often you see people really going in one direction, either out of experience or because it's guesswork or because they are simply stressed and try to find something to fix. Sometimes they might even go for down the route where they think this is most likely the point that is most the most easy to fix. And then they just want to confirm uh, what they have already thought about. And the value of really automated uh, analysis here is that this doesn't happen. And we talked about this in the preparation here. I usually use a very simple example here in the demo, and it's, it's a web application. Um, and it, it, sh it shows this error message that says, uh, method XYZ of undefined is not defined. Like this, this usual JavaScript uh, error that, that, that you will see if um, obviously you have code that tries to access something that's, that's not properly done. And when everybody says, yes, we have to go to the front end team, like this is the front end, they all let's go to the front end team and ask them what they deployed. And then I tell them, well, if you go to the front end team right now, they will tell you that they didn't deploy anything in the last four days. Yes, but this is a front end error. I mean, it's obvious, it must be the front end team. So they must have done something that we maybe somebody roll back or anything. And, and only later you find out, like we have like this automated root cause um, analysis capabilities is as part of uh, monitoring solutions that the actual reason is that the MongoDB in the backend crashed. And what does MongoDB do? MongoDB ships the JavaScript files to the front end. So the reason why the front end is not working is because anything was changed with the front end code, but your JavaScript files were not shipped to the front end. And that's why you get a lot of JavaScript error. And I think this is a great example of human bias. Like we see this like one indicator it lets us run in one direction and ev ignore everything left and right. And the advantage here really of an automated system is, or an, an AI based system is it, it doesn't have to buy that bias that it just goes in that one direction. It tests every possible um, option and just see which one is the most likely one. And also tries to invalidate what, what is not properly working because obviously it's also much quicker. As humans, we have to also kind of like rely on this bias. I mean, to be fair, if you have to sit it goes with all of these large amounts of data. We, we have to set priorities. We have to say we can go this here and focus on something else. That's uh, 
um, how we also survived as humans, even in the early days, like we, when we were running away from a, a uh, tiger or in, in, uh, dangerous animals, we were looking at the, ro at the road in front of us that we not like don't fall over or anything. Like we were not looking whether the sky is going to be pretty or whether nice flowers next to us. So we were focusing on the problem at hand. And the same happens here. Like if we find a hint, we focus on this and you really get this to be more objectivized if you have an automated system analyzing this and, and putting you in the right direction. Yeah, that makes sense. Actually, in my troubleshooting, you know, as a manager of people doing troubleshooting or whatever, anytime someone said, oh, it can't possibly be X, Y, Z, I'm like, let's look at X, Y, Z first. Because <laughs> inevitably, by trimming that part of the tree, of, you know, the research tree, um, you're you're very likely to have missed something. So, um, so it's sort of in line with what you're saying, right? The bias is like, it can't be that because that's my baby and, you know, it's perfect. <laughs> you see that a lot with engineers in particular. Um, probably I've done that as well. Yeah, uh, so I think it's very natural because people try to find the solution super quickly and they have to rely on experience. But experience obviously can sometimes lead us in the wrong direction. That makes sense. So um, following up on that, uh, I'm guessing, Brenton, one of the things that helps make these biases worse, uh, maybe that's not the best English, but you know what I'm saying, um, exacerbates the problem is not everyone has a shared understanding of the problem, like of how this the system context or whatever. And so the database, right. people the database front end people know the front end, but nobody knows the whole thing. So what what's your thought on that? Is that what you're seeing out in the field? And what would you do to kind of fix that? Yeah, and that's that's why that that initial workshop with with uh, multi different disciplines involved. Uh, know who know the application, but but all know the application from different layers and different viewpoints. Um, while each of those individual actors, while you're you're figuring out. Well, what do we want our base response times to be? What do we want our ideal, uh, you know, database call response times to be? Um, by 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 making that team as eclectic and and, and as across disciplines as possible, um, you're, you're able to sort of counter each other's balance, uh, biases, right? Balance them out. Um, but what the tools do is they really take the bias out. And, and I think Alois would agree with that, is, is if you have a degraded response time in a call to a database, you're going to see that. You're not going to be able to argue with that, right? Um, the, the monitoring, the tools, the data uh, give you the roadmap towards that incident resolution, towards that root cause, um, without allowing essentially actors to enact on their biases. Now, with incident responses, it's pretty common. Uh, for for known root causes right um but where the tool really sets itself apart is brand new issues right incidents we haven't seen before that's where mining that data uh, that the tool has gathered like from the agents that you had said Alois, something all the way down to maybe disk queue lane um you know stacking up uh, disk io um, all of that information is available from a centralized point which allows that rapid response um, it's absolutely vital to have. So uh, the tool itself removes that human bias and gives you those hard, cold facts. Great, thanks for that. So the other thing I was thinking as you're talking about this, uh, as we talked about it in the past, is um, you know this example of you know looking in the wrong place or you have to research all this data. Is how do, how do people know how to do that, right? Like it's not an inherent skill. <laughs> so it seems like training would be a big key here and so I always what kind of how would you address training of you know essentially practicing yeah um I think it's important that um because like most of these these situations are always exceptional like systems not working high stress a lot of money at risk company reputation at risk so first of all obviously sure. systems take a lot of the complexity by pre-analyzing the data and putting you in the right direction uh, but still, you can do something to make the situation less stressful. And there is this um, saying that I recently heard. I think it's from actually the Navy SEALs. That is, you don't live up to the situation, but you fall back to your training. And I think that that's very important. So just because the situation gets hard, you're not getting like massively better at doing something. So what people should practice and what you can even make as a gamification for your team and to make things feel more natural is to, for example, use chaos tests, uh, chaos engineering, like you run chaos experiments and let people find out what actually happens. So they get way more familiar with those situations and 
Today we have great tools, some of them open source, some of them commercial, where they can run experiments and try to figure it out. And you can even make this a fun activity. So this doesn't need to be like somebody sitting there with a stopwatch and saying, okay, can you find out what's broken or what um, gets broken right now? This can be even, uh, it, uh, depending how the situation allows it, like a social gathering and a gamification, like two teams trying to find an issue first or, or working on it. So the more familiar you are with the process, the better it is. And you also need to be familiar with the tool, even if the tools puts you or pushes you in a lot of the right directions. If the time you first see your observability, your monitoring tool, when you actually have a problem, that's not when you want to see it. You want to be familiar with this. You want to understand how to configure it, how to use it, how to query, and how to interact with it. And this, these are all things that you can train, uh, for example, with chaos experiments where you deliberately let things fail. And again, you can even make like a, a funny social event out of it that you run chaos experiments and then you have three teams and you look which team finds the problem first uh, by giving them the information that they have. And then as they're more familiar with it, you will know that once they're in the same situation, they can go back to their experience and like follow the same procedure and follow the same approaches than they did in, uh, in the training situation. Basically, that's how we do most of the things uh, that we learn. We just don't go out and do things. Usually training is a very central component. And usually we train way more than we um, like are like in a competition if it's sports or anything. Yeah, I, mean, I think in sports they say that 80% or more of your actual activities are in the training sessions versus versus the actual matches. Uh, okay, so that's good. Um, just checking real quick, see if there's any audience questions. Doesn't look like it yet. So let's just move on. Uh, I've got another poll to bring up. So Kristen, really help bring that poll up. Awesome. So at what stage of the observability journey are you? So a lot of you know about it. Some of you probably are implementing. So we're interested in, you know, where where everyone's at in that journey. So Brenton, uh, what type of music do you like to play? Um, I like to do a lot of uh, uh, weird stuff. I'll, t I'll take uh, metal songs or, or, or harder songs and, and uh, balladize them. Uh, I find that to be challenging and fun. Um, playing tool on a ukulele, I mean, that's, that's uh, uh, as in chaos experiments, I guess, on, on the ukulele would be my uh, <laughs> would be my forte. But aren't they saying that everybody can play on a ukulele? So it, it always sounds pretty good. Absolutely no, I, I, and it is it is so easy to pick up. It's quick to pick up. It was my intro into bass, so. Um, uh, if, if you're looking for something to eat some time on your observability journey, pick up a ukulele to go with you. Um, it, uh, it, it, it comes in handy at campfires, I'll tell you. All right, so um, why don't we go ahead and close the poll? Close the poll, yep. And look at the results. Well, I'm thinking about tool being played on the ukulele. <laughs> so a lot of people are in the internal stakeholders identified so in the beginning executive buy-in so kind of on the beginning side which again probably why you join to to listen to us um get some ideas on how to move the project forward awesome it would be interesting to know what the others are maybe they can add something to the chat to what are, because it's like 40 percent others yeah 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 feel free to to let us know and uh Kristen will relay that information all right, so um, so let's talk about barriers to get started because I think that's actually really relevant to the audience is uh, they're probably uh, seeing some issues. So, you know, cost obviously is going to come up, right, with executives. So what's your take on the cost? Um, is, it, is it really a high cost or are, are people missing the big, bigger picture? Uh, yeah, the, the cost conversation always comes up. So these tools are obviously not uh, not for free, like most tools that we're actually using, like any service that we're using. Um, you can obviously start with open source tools usually in the beginning, uh, and it was also a CNCF, so on the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, a summary where, okay, uh, an 
adoption report where they said that a lot of people start with uh, free tooling, but then they move to commercial vendors. And the interesting point is, why do people move to commercial vendors? And I know it's always interesting if a commercial vendor tells you this, but you, you have to figure out that also a monitoring solution is yet another piece of software that you have to run, that you have to maintain. And also keep in mind that the monitoring solution needs to have a higher availability and uptime than the rest of your systems, because otherwise it doesn't provide that value. Because if your monitoring system is down, when your other systems are down, you wouldn't actually see it. Usually they process massive amounts of data and they want to work with very low latency. So running these systems and keeping them up and running is usually a lot of work, also maintaining them and keeping them up and running. And I think what a lot of people see, well, I can do it myself because it doesn't cost me anything because we have four people here who want to take care of it. Well, those four people also cost you money. Like it's not that they would, they could do something else. So that's like the opportunity cost on the one hand. And I think the, the other topic is, uh, that a lot of people think about, um, well, we don't actually have a problem. So, and we, our applications are actually running fine. So we don't need it. It's like, do you want to get insurance for your car or for your house or for your car? At least here in Austria, you have to, and there's good reasons for this. If something ever happens, uh, I think that's the wrong way to think about it. Um, if you run a reasonably complex system, you will always have issues. And you might be able to, to find them without maybe um, sophisticated tooling eventually. Uh, but the problem is how much time does it take you? And this is also opportunity cost. Sometimes we heard from people it takes you like weeks to find what the actual issue is, is especially with intermittent errors that you cannot easily analyze. So we're not just talking about maybe something very obvious like a disk failing or a network segment failing, but something maybe only happening for a sub segment of your customers where tracing is super helpful that you can ident exactly identify this like one request from this customer what's what's going wrong there which otherwise might take you forever and you don't want to call your customer about the problem and, and, and beyond that very often you might even know that you're having issues if you run a reasonably large web property for example users usually won't call you if the application is not working they will move somewhere else like if you're running an online job and it's not working and people cannot check out they will move somewhere else so there might be a lot of problems implicitly in there as well plus um as i mentioned in the beginning a lot of uh observability tooling is still used a lot for resolving problems but there's other areas as well if you can identify optimization potential to make your applications run not only faster, but also consume less resources. That, that That's also where I get a massive benefit out of it. And also like having this better understanding of, of your systems as a whole. So yes, there is cost, but if you look at all of these different areas and also related benefits, like if your team maybe spends, uh, and, and we have those numbers when we work with some customers where they automated a lot of the remediation processes like that to, like restarting machines, scaling things up that might usually take hours into um, seconds or even less. And you get back people's time and usually all of us don't have enough people to work on interesting projects. So my answer is how much is the worth of that or the, the interesting project that you don't have time to work on because you're busy, your people are so busy keeping the lights on. And then suddenly if you take all that cost into account, I think you have a different cost benefit that like what, uh, comparing it like to that one outage that you might have had maybe maybe half a year ago. So it really requires to more holistically to look at what do you want people to really spend uh, time on. Plus there's obviously other costs usually when things really start to hit you, the, uh, the amount of impact is, uh, is, is massive if you don't have the proper tools in place. It's a difference if you're if, if if an application is unavailable for two minutes or it's unavailable for four hours. Yeah, and another thing is as an engineering manager and the perspective there is a lot of times your most critical path resources end up getting, you know, pulled off to deal deal with these analyses. And uh, so it's it's actually the cost is worse than that person's time because you're actually potentially blocking more people, like two other developers and two QA. They're they're waiting, right? So um, yeah. you have to think about that too. There's a knock-on effect 
they need the best people. And that's that that's a very interesting point, yeah. Because if you don't know where to start and if a reasonably complex system, what people like historically did, not like to use the military analogy here, but they used to have a war room. So because we don't know what is broken, we better bring everybody in the company into like one room and let them figure it out. And if there's like just only one service that's not working and you bring 20 people in there, you're you're more or less wasting 19 people's time. Yeah. For how long it takes to resolve the problem. So the costs then are massive. And if you take all of this into account, suddenly uh, the investment in uh, improper observability tooling becomes way less the issue than otherwise the cost that, that you would incur uh, for analyzing those problems. Yeah, so yeah, so I think that argument about costs, I mean, it's very difficult when costs are hidden. <laughs> you know, they're non-obvious, uh, especially when you're talking to your CFO or whatever, but I think that story is, is the right story. Um, so I want to get to one last point, and this is about um, uh, customers getting involved in the process, right? So your SaaS provider and all of a sudden you have a big customer and they're like, we want to know about, you know, we want to get reports out of how your system's running. Um, we think that's a good or a bad thing. I'll start with you, Brent. What do you, what's your thought? Well, it can be both. Uh, from a uh, from a trust perspective, from a uh, confidence perspective, you, if you're very confident in your app, you know your app performs. Um, and 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 some customers, you know, of size and scale, actually demand this visibility, right? If you if you're going to be hosting or running a managed service application for them. Um, it's a it's a it's an olive branch. It's a shake of trust. It's also a you know the customer has clear visibility into the performance of the application and you know can of course say hey our application's not performing. Um, that just puts more onus on the team and the tool to to find those issues earlier um, and, and begin to resolve those issues uh, before customers have visibility into it. Um, but when when you have a hosted shared application uh, that you are providing. Um, many customers are, are demanding that they have this visibility. So um, again, just build a quality app, uh, keep it stable and use the tools for what they're there for, which is to continually optimize your implementation the way you design your application and future, future enhancements. Uh, so that the customer, every time they look at that page, it's nice and it's clean and it's what they expect and it's what they're expecting you to deliver. Again, increasing your reputation. Yeah, but even if there is an issue, I mean, the working together with the customer and them being able to see like, oh yes, you have a problem and you see what you're doing about it. Um, I think that I think that creates a good partnership with the customer and I think that's how long-term relationships really flourish. So it does seem like a good idea. So Alois, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, I think this, this, this trust and, and common understanding is uh, super important even in this, um, Type of interaction. Very often, there are discussions that you want to have with uh, with your customers that might lead to them investing more in in infrastructure um, that that they that they are using. Uh, I remember one example of one customer where, well, but the, the SaaS provider was the customer. They talked to their customer and say, "Well, you should actually uh, buy faster storage and you should increase your network capacity." This is usually what you hear, obviously, from somebody providing these services. I mean, this is obviously what they're asking you to do. But when they then together looked at the data and could show them, well, you're using, you have way more usage of your application than you had in the past. This is the impact on disk access. This is the impact on user experience for, again, their customers. And this is how we can, um, how we could resolve it. It became pretty obvious that the recommendation uh, from from the service provider was actually the right one. Plus, not only did they re uh, see why they were provide why they were offering them uh, these choices and recommending to to upgrade their infrastructure. Also, after they did it, they could immediately see the impact it had. It wasn't just oh yeah, now you have fast storage, great. No, now your users are more happy because they could track it all the way to response times for users, user engagement and all of those metrics. So it, it really creates this transparency you want to have uh, in, in this process. And as, as Brent put it out there as well, like you want to have like this eye level uh, interaction between both parties and not just, oh, what are they hiding? What are they not, 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 not telling me? And it makes, especially those hard conversations much easier. That makes sense. 
All right, so we don't have any questions yet from the audience. Um, we'll give them a couple of minutes. Why don't we throw up a third poll and uh, audience, if you have any uh, questions for Alois or Brenton or myself, um, this is your opportunity. Uh, so Kristen, you wanna? Yeah. Here we go. All right, so as you're moving down this journey and a lot of you are early on, so what path do you think you'll take on this journey? Um, or work with a partner, uh, hire your own team, et cetera. So interested to know what people are thinking there. So feel free to vote on the poll. And if you haven't, like I say, if you have any questions, please let us know. Uh, happy to answer them. Uh, give me one second. There we go. Awesome. So either work with a partner or hire people. Um, makes sense. Awesome. Um, Chris, any questions? I am not seeing any questions. Okay. Well, I guess people. That doesn't mean that there's something out there I haven't seen. <laughs> So <clears throat> feel free to send in your questions or uh, flag me down in the chat window, either or, uh, if you're if you're feeling I'm looking over and I there. haven't seen you. <laughs> it looks like there's a Stuart Zimmerman out there that's got his hand raised. I've never seen that before, but that's a cool feature. Yes, no. Yeah. Uh, Stuart, do you have a question for us? If you do, we can just actually unmute your mic and have you ask you directly. Yeah. And if not, um, I'm happy to wrap this thing up. Um, so yeah, so always, Brenton, thanks for joining me today. It's been really insightful conversation. I've enjoyed it. I enjoyed all the prep as usual. Um, on the presentation now, you can see our contact information. So if you do end up having a question or you watch this again to listen to it and uh, want to want to reach out to us, then uh, feel free to reach out to any of us. We're happy to field those questions and help you on your journey. Uh, so again, always, Brenton, thank you. Uh, audience, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's always appreciated that you join us. Uh, wouldn't make yeah, a lot of Thank you for having me. <laughs> Bye, everyone. OK, so thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, just to recap, anyone who is attending, I will uh, we will be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the recording. Um, and of course, feel free to contact us or any of our panelists here today. And again, thank you everyone for attending.